bonjour à vous tous. Et je voudrais tout d'abord remercier Mme Valérie Gislard et son association pour l'invitation. C'est vraiment un plaisir d'être ici, à Paris. C'est toujours un plaisir d'être à Paris, mais il fait particulièrement froid ce matin. Vous avez probablement aussi euh, euh, senti ça. Euh, J'ai compris que la session de ce matin se passera en anglais, donc je vais changer en anglais pour l'exposé scientifique. So what I would like to do is um, take you through what I call a fascinating journey of the discovery of the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is uh, something uh, which is particularly, um, yeah, for me, something very special and emotional because it really uh, determined my scientific career because it was my first contact with a family with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome that determined my interest in genetics and that uh, took me through the scientific journey that I left afterwards. But maybe just a brief uh, recollection of where the name Ehlers-Danlos comes from. Eh? It is, uh, of course, a French scientist, a French doctor, Monsieur Danlos, and also a Danish dermatologist, Mr. Ehlers, who determined, who described for the first time scientifically the syndrome. Although the condition was known as a curiosity for a much longer time already, and, and people were fascinated by the elasticity of the skin and the joint, the remarkable joint hypermobility that uh, uh, persons affected by ehlers danlos syndrome showed, but it was merely, it was not really seen as a medical condition initially. And it was only through the, through the report of those pioneers that first the, the condition was described really as a medical condition. But for me, my story begins as a, as a young um, student in medicine, where I had the opportunity to, to meet this very remarkable family, a family that uh, came to the consultation with a, with a story that all the people in the family that were born with club feet and with thin skin and hyperlaxity, that they all died at young age from what appeared to be a serious vascular incident, an arterial rupture. And it was a sort of um, you know, unknown truth in the family and, and, no, and it was a sort of taboo also because every time a child was born, they were looking at the feet to see whether they were club foot or not because they knew that was the sign that the family member or the individual or the child was affected with the condition. But at that time, we never heard of such a condition. It was completely unknown in Belgium, and I think also in, in many other countries, we didn't know at all what this condition was. So I was assigned the task of looking through the literature and trying to find what the diagnosis of that family could be. And so I, that's what I did, and I came across the very famous book of Professor Victor McCusick, a famous geneticist in the United States, who was really the first person to describe in a comprehensive textbook what heritable disorders of connective tissue were, and he was the first to categorize the ehlers danlos syndrome in that category of connective tissue diseases together with other known conditions such as Marfan syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta, and many others. And for a long time, his work was really the Bible for all people working, for all scientists working uh, in the field of heritable connective tissue diseases. But of course, he was not the only one, and there were other people, in, uh, also in Europe, who already were interested and fascinated by Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and even had written a book on the, on, the, on the condition. And I think this person, Peter Byton, Professor Peter Byton, who was uh, from the UK, but who re uh, later on moved to South Africa and established the genetic service in uh, Cape Town. He was also one of really of the pioneers who very accurately and clinically described Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, especially the hypermobility and, and everything that had to do with uh, hypermobile joints. 
But of course, um, at that time, this was in the early 70s, um, no one had a clue. There was a clinical description. We knew that there, or uh, it, it was already apparent that there would be different presentations, different forms probably of the ehlers Danlos syndrome, but there was no clue as what was the cause, genetically the cause of these conditions and what caused these connective tissue abnormalities. Until in 1972, there was a first publication that pointed to a deficiency in the collagen metabolism, a, a deficiency of an enzyme that was responsible for hydroxylation of certain amino acids in collagen molecules. And that was in a presentation of a very particular form of ehlers danlos syndrome with ocular abnormalities and uh, severe scoliosis besides the classical ehlers danlos symptoms. And then there was a second uh, clue that came a little bit later where through biochemical analysis, another dermatologist and geneticist, Dr. Michael Pope, pointed to the possibility that type 3 collagen, another collagen molecule, could be important in the pathogenesis of vascular ehlers danlos syndrome. But you see only, only biochemical clues. There was no molecular evidence at that time yet. But OK, with that knowledge in mind, I uh, went with the blood samples and, uh, and the skin biopsies that I had taken in that family. I went to London to the lab of Michael Pope to study, because then DNA analysis and molecular studies were coming along, to trying to find the gene in that family. And that was really, we succeeded in, in showing that the condition was linked to the gene encoding type 3 collagen. So that was really the first uh, molecular clue that collagen and genes responsible for uh, the production of collagen were linked to, causally linked to ehlers danlos syndrome, and in particular the vascular form of ehlers danlos syndrome, because that appeared to be the diagnosis, of course, in the family. And subsequently, of course, we know that the genetic cause of vascular form of ehlers danlos syndrome is always a mutation in type 3 collagen. There are a whole bunch of mutations reported now, many different types of mutations, but it is all linked to the called 3A1 gene, the gene encoding type 3 collagen. So this really was the start of a series of molecular uh, discoveries that led to uh, identification of, of many uh, other forms of ehlers danlos syndrome. But at that time, something uh, or oh, another important thing happened because every, every scientist that was, uh, or all the major groups of, of scientists that were working on connective tissue disorders decided to gather in, um, in Berlin at the occasion of an international genetics meeting to set up a first comprehensive classification of all connective tissue disorders that were known at that time. So within the, 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 the context of that work, the very first uh, comprehensive classification of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome was made. And at that time, of course, with only very few, as I said, very few molecular evidence already, only for some subtypes, we knew more or less that there, was, that there, might, have, uh, there might be collagen uh, problems involved. But that was, that was the start, and, and, and it is important to mention because already then, the, um, I think one realized that it is very important to try to describe accurately, accurately what a condition is and to try to classify and make distinctions from one condition to another. So it, it really set the tone uh, on how we had to proceed with, with, with research, with tackling research in this group of disorders. So when I came back from, from the UK, then I, I defended my PhD on uh, partly on Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, partly also on osteogenesis imperfecta, which I also had worked on. And then I decided, because I thought this was very, very important, to set up a clinic for patients with connective tissue diseases so that I could get clinical experience in what the, all the different aspects, all the different clinical problems, all the different, different clinical presentations were, on the one hand. And on the other hand, set up a laboratory <coughs> at that time for biochemical collagen studies and also 
start with a molecular lab to, uh, to do um, genetic analysis, molecular analysis where possible. So and I've always experienced that the combination of both having the clinic at the one hand and the, the lab on the other hand was a very fruitful combination to gain expertise and to start from clinical presentations, uh, try to, to, to find solutions in the lab and vice versa when we found uh, new molecular results, really um, tell them to the patients and have the patients benefit from, from those uh, findings. And so we, we gradually saw more and more patients and then um, I think another important um, scientific uh, finding was that at, at a certain point we came across this, the story of this little girl that was, um, her story was characterized by a very, very pronounced skin fragility. And her clinical picture, she also had other symptoms of ehlers danlos syndrome, but the skin fragility was particularly striking and she was really very fragile. Um, and her, her, her uh, clinical history was reminiscent of a condition that was known already in cattle, and that was called dermatosporaxis. That was cattle with a very, very fragile skin also. So um, knowing, of starting from, from what we knew from, from um, this, uh, these studies, these animal studies, we started to uh, a study together with, uh, with my colleagues in Liège, who at that time who were the ones who had um, uh, reported and who had discovered the dermatosporaxis in cattle. And we indeed could um, show that this little girl had a similar um, molecular deficiency of, uh, of collagen in, and that she was uh, forming, and I don't know whether it shows very well in the, in the picture, but that she was forming very abnormal collagen fibrils, which we know, now know and determine as hieroglyphic collagen fibrils, and which is really a very particular hallmark of that form of ehlers danlos syndrome. So it appeared that that girl indeed had a problem with the cleavage of one of the propeptide, uh, propeptides, the, the aminopropeptide of type 1 collagen. So it was, this was a, yes, a, a second major discovery, I think, in, in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and it, it showed that um, already, that what we would confirm later, that probably this condition would be a very heterogeneous condition, that there would be many, many different um, defects, not only in the collagen metabolism, but, but as we will see later on, also in other biochemical pathways. But then, okay, we knew already some of the molecular clues, but at that time, we didn't know at all what the molecular defect in the classic form of ehlers danlos syndrome was, the form that was most obvious and was most well known with the typical skin, uh, hy uh, hyper uh, skin hypersensibility, the joint hypermobility, the scarring, and so on. So at a certain uh, point, we, uh, we saw in the clinic a family, this is a, uh, a sister and a brother, and also with an affected father who had a typical clinical presentation of classic ehlers danlos syndrome. And we had done a lot of biochemical studies at that time in people with classic uh, ehlers danlos syndrome, which all uh, appeared to be normal. So we didn't find, through biochemical analysis, we didn't really find the clue to the, to the underlying molecular defect. But there were some studies published uh, at that time which did give a hint. And First of all, there was a, a, st a study, a mouse model that was created for type 5 collagen. And type 5 collagen appears to be an important regulator in the collagen fibrogenesis. It's uh, uh, much better documented also afterwards. And then secondly, the, a patient was reported which had a translocation involving the X chromosome that disrupted the one of the type 5 collagen genes and this patient presented, among others, with symptoms reminiscent of classic ehlers danlos syndrome. So we started to do, as well, biochemical studies and molecular studies in the family. And this family was a particularly instrumental because, as you may see from, and I will try to show that, as you may, sorry. Oops. 
doesn't light up, apparently. No, but it doesn't matter. As you can see from the middle picture, these patients did show a biochemical abnormality in the sense that they did not produce type 5 collagen. And this appeared to be due, as, as, as we could show later on, appeared to be due to a mutation that affected a certain cysteine residue in, in one of the propeptides of type 1 collagen, the C-propeptide. And because this uh, cysteine was replaced by another amino acid, a serine residue, these uh, alpha chains could not be incorporated into molecules. So that resulted in a deficiency of production of type 5 collagen. And later on, with, with subsequent studies, we, we performed not, not only us, but, but many, many artists in, uh, in the meantime uh, studied a, a, a lot of, of, of other patients. And it appears now that the classic form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in most of the cases, in over 90% of cases, is due to a mutation in the, one of the genes encoding type 5 collagen. So this is really a well-established relation. So, but at that time, uh, again, so uh, I, I already talked about the Berlin Ozology, which was the, the, the very first attempt of classification. We had uh, additional molecular information which uh, urged us to re review the, the present, uh, uh, at that time, uh, classification of ehlers danlos syndrome. So, and it was really thanks to the support of the patient organization, the French patient organization and the organization in UK and, and in the United States, that we could organize a small scientific meeting with, uh, with a number of people to revise this uh, EDS classification and to establish what, we, what was uh, later for a long time referred to as the, as the Villefranche classification because the meeting took place in Villefranche uh, in the south of France. And where we attempted for the first time to really start from biochemical and molecular evidence in the classification. And that resulted in uh, these um, six subtypes which, uh, which were all uh, let's say, solved at the molecular level, except for this particular hypermobility type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is still up to now, um, of course, uh, the one million dollar question, what is, what is the genetic cause of hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? And we will come back to that here in the meeting, certainly. But now we know, of course, that this classification is again outdated, and it has been mentioned by Lara uh, that a new classification has in the meantime been established. But for a long time, this was really the basis for uh, many of us to work on. And we continue to see patients in, uh, and to, do the, or to, to run the, the um, connective tissue clinic and um, to see many, many more patients. And for all patients, we always tried, and I think that's very important, to do a very rigorous clinical workup <coughs> together with biochemical studies and, where possible, molecular studies if we had a certain clue. Because at that time, you know, the whole uh, exome analysis and genome analysis didn't exist, of course, so you had really to go very thoroughly uh, to very focused on on what uh, you wanted to do as molecular work. But every now and then, and, and, and I mention that because I think it, this, this, uh, this remains important to, to really start from the clinic, every now and then we saw, or uh, we could pick up uh, abnormalities uh, that were unexpected, and that showed us that there are really uh, almost some, some very rare or some very private subgroups of patients that present with symptoms of the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or that present what we now uh, classify as a particular subtype of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and that were detected only through the combination of this clinical and biochemical or molecular workup together. And for ex two examples of these are what we now call the, cardio, the cardiac valvular subtype where the biochemical clue is an absence of a production of the alpha-2 chain of type 1 collagen, and you can pick this up only by biochemical analysis. And it is important to recognize this subgroup because of the cardiovascular <coughs> prognosis, eh, because these people, at, uh, when they 
uh, at a young age, these children have some, some valvular insufficiency, but that turns out to become more serious uh, in adulthood. So it is important for the clinical follow-up, for the cardiovascular follow-up, to be aware of the, of the risks and, and, and to have the exact diagnosis. And another example is this uh, form of yeah, classic or classic-like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome presentation is like classic Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, except that people uh, in this subtype also have this uh, risk, an enhanced risk for spontaneous arterial ruptures, which are due to very specific type of mutation in type 1 collagen, which uh, leads to a substitution of an arginine residue by an aminic acid, uh, by cysteine, sorry, it's always substitution by cysteine, and therefore they have this particular biochemical pattern that you can detect with collagen electrophoresis. So these studies, these biochemical studies, are not uh, only really for scientific purposes. They really have or can have clinical impli implications for the counseling of patients. And again, our story continued. We uh, came also across a, two families from Turkish origin because we, at that time, had a very well-established clinical service and, and, and laboratory service. So we also get a, go, uh, get a lot of referrals from abroad. So these families were referred really from, from, from outside Belgium to us with a, a, a particular clinical presentation that um, was very reminiscent of a, another subtype of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that was already described by Beat Steinmann in Zurich, and that was referred to at that time as the type 6A Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. We don't use the, 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 the numbers now anymore, but it was uh, <laughs> what we now call the oculoscoliotic type. And this, this uh, Turkish, um, it, was a, 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 it were two consanguineous families, where you can see that they, that they have a particular clinical presentation with microcornia, with specific <laughs> ocular abnormalities, also scoliosis, but also very peculiar um, fingers, tapering fingers with contractures uh, and uh, with club feet. And if you compare the two faces, this is the patient described by Beat Steinmann. And when you see this, uh, this girl, you, you can really see the clinical resemblance already in the face. But when we did part, the, the biochemical analysis in that uh, family, we expected to find the, the typical abnormality for the type 6A that Steinmann described, which is the lysyl hydroxylase deficiency. But we couldn't find it in this family. It was completely normal, the, the lysyl hydroxylase function. So we referred to it as possibly a type 6B, of which we, uh, we didn't know what the cause was. But because of the consanguinity, we started, we started uh, at that time with homozygosity mapping studies. And this led to the identification of, because this is a, a recessive form, of a homozygous mutation in a, well, at that time for us, rather unexpected, but not uh, uh, I would say not 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 implausible um, gene, and this is the CHST14 gene or 14 gene, which encodes an enzyme that is important in the proteoglycan biosynthesis. And of course, proteoglycans are next to collagen another very important structural constituent of the connective tissues. So this was certainly it was well it was not. Uh, expected at the first time, but it certainly was very plausible <coughs> that also defects in proteoglycan biosynthesis could be responsible for uh, connective tissue disorders. And the, uh, because, because of the uh, clinical presentation, uh, this subtype was called uh, subsequently the musculocontractural, because there was also an important hypotonia, and there were this very particular specific contractures already um, at birth um, present to so congenital. But of course, this, uh, this opened a totally new avenue for EDS research, because it pointed to the fact that we also had to look in more detail at proteoglycan biosynthesis. And this set the, the way, in fact, for the discovery of uh, several other forms of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which all were due and this is, 
it doesn't work. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, no, it doesn't work. The pointer, so I cannot show it, but I can show it here. So this is the defect here, the enzyme interfering with the musculocontractural type. But as you see, proteoglycans are formed by a core protein and then chains of uh, glycosaminoglycans, which are really the saccharide subunits and the linker enzymes that are important for attachment of those glycosaminoglycans to the core protein, these, all these steps are enzymatically uh, mediated. And we know now that in, in different uh, enzy enzymatic steps of this biosynthetic pathway, something can go wrong. There can be a mutation that leads to one or another form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And so, um, we, um, we, we, we could report another form that was due to one of those enzymatic defects, uh, an, um, a mutation in the beta 3 cal 6 and, um, enzyme, oh, gene encoding another enzyme that was responsible uh, for uh, a defect in the, in the biosynthesis of that linker region, and which showed, besides classic uh, presentation of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, also features of the musculocontractural type, but also an important spondylo epimetaphyseal dysplasia, so involvement really of the skeleton. And that is typical for all these forms that are uh, due to mutations in that linker region of proteoglycan metabolism. These patients also may show some intellectual deficit. So I will stop my presentation here, and I want um, maybe to set of, of, of to uh, to say something in conclusion, uh, some thoughts in conclusion to share with you. That I hope that I've shown you, and this should give hope to everyone, that we have come a long way. If you imagine that a couple of decades ago, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome was virtually unknown, that we did not know at all anything about the genetic cause of that disorder, then I think we've already come a long way. And I know there's still a lot of work to do, and there will be many more forms discovered, I think. There will be many other rare types, but we now have the tools to progress. And I think the way to progress is, and that's my, my second message, always combine a very rigorous clinical workup, clinical description, clinical documentation, through clinical examination, but also radiographs, other clinical investigations, combine this with genetic studies. Genetic studies that mean still include biochemical analysis at some point. And I know that many labs now have left the biochemical studies, but I think they remain a very important clue to discovering the genetic cause of many of, of, of this type of diseases. So the combination of the, the, the multidisciplinary approach is very important, I think, from the scientific side. But it is important also because it helps to stratify risks for the patients. And we see that certain of those subtypes really hold specific cardiovascular risks, for example, or specific other risks, so, which is important to, for the management, for the follow-up of the patients in the clinic. And then last but not least, I will uh, support what Lara has said, that we must work on increasing the awareness among the medical community about what Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is. It is still um, a too poorly known condition, I think, in the medical world, and, and for many, uh, still a very puzzling uh, group of diseases that uh, they cannot really define very specifically. So we have all to, uh, to, I think, to work also on that aspect and, uh, um, and promote the multidisciplinary approach of patients uh, with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in the clinic because only through that way we can give optimal care and management. And I would like now to pass immediately the word on to my collaborator, Francisca Malfe, because she will tell you the next story and what, what, comes, what comes after the discovery of the proteoglycan metabolism, because a lot has happened uh, since then, I think. And uh, Thank okay. you so much. I will stop here. Thank you.